1920s, one invention would signal the start of the modern era and the dissemination of information around the world. For the first time, the events of history could be reported as they happened to almost anywhere on Earth. That historic invention was radio. Welcome fellow YouTubers. The Roaring Twenties radio channel brings you another video on early radio. Hello everybody, welcome to another video from the Roaring Twenties radio YouTube channel. This video is going to be on the vacuum tube from its invention in 1905 and its development through 1929. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of the vacuum tube in this video. It is an interesting history to delve into, but if I tried to include everything from the history of vacuum tubes, it would end up being 20 or more one hour videos. So I'll just try to hit most of the high points. Forgive me if I have left something out that you may have thought should be included. When most people think of vacuum tubes, the names that come to mind are Fleming and DeForest. Fewer people tie the name of Thomas Edison to them. Without Edison, there might not be vacuum tubes. Back in 1881, while looking for a way to prevent the carbon coating in his carbon filament light bulb, Thomas Edison added a metal plate inside the sealed bulb. He noticed that when the metal plate was connected to a positive voltage, current flowed from the filament to the metal plate through the vacuum inside the tube. It was later called the Edison effect, and in 1884, a patent was awarded to Edison. Later, Edison's discovery would be called a thermionic emission. Edison knew of no use for his discovery, but two decades later, another inventor would build on Edison's work. His name was John Ambrose Fleming, and in 1904, using Edison's discovery, Fleming created the first vacuum tube. Fleming's tube would consist of two elements, a heated electron emitting cathode and an anode or plate. Electrons could only flow in one direction, from the cathode to the anode. This was similar to a water valve, which is why early tubes were often called valves. Fleming had designed his tube for use as a detector, but years later its main use would be as a diode. Fleming had created a thermionic diode tube and would be granted a patent on his invention in 1905. One year later, in 1906, another inventor would build on Fleming's work to invent another type of tube, one that amplified radio and audio signals. It would be called the Audion Tube, and its inventor, Lee DeForest, would end up as one of the most famous men in radio history by stumbling into an invention. DeForest discovered that by adding a grid between the heated cathode and the plate of Fleming's tube, he could control the current between the cathode and the plate. The force addition of a grid allowed the tube to rectify and amplify electric signals. His invention was the first triode radio tube. DeForest would be granted a patent on his invention in 1908, but he still didn't understand how it worked. It wasn't until 1913 that the workings of the Audion tube were understood. A young engineer named Edwin Armstrong studied DeForest's Audion tube and was finally able to explain how it worked. DeForest tube would make receiving radio signals from great distances possible by amplifying the signal coming into a receiver. The tube radios that evolved from DeForest's invention would later add an amplifying circuit with a second tube to amplify the audio signal so that radios could take advantage of another invention, the speaker horn. In 1914, Marconi Company licensed the rights to Fleming's patent and shortly after that, the company's American Marconi subsidiary would file a patent infringement lawsuit against DeForest for violating Fleming's patent. The court's final ruling came in 1916, when it ruled that both Fleming's patent and DeForest's patent were legal and valid. The decision made vacuum tube production for the public illegal. Vacuum tubes that violated the patents could still be manufactured for the military. General Electric Laboratory was developing prototype vacuum tubes in 1912, and by 1915 began manufacturing them under the Pliotron name. The U.S. Navy ordered 1,000 of the tubes in 1917. After World War I, the United States government would form a plan to end the patent stalemate by having General Electric form a radio subsidiary and buy American Marconi. That company would be then be taken over and under the control of the new GE subsidiary, Radio Corporation of America, which would eventually become RCA. RCA was basically a patent trust, 
Together with GE's existing patents, RCA would begin selling radio tubes made by GE with the branded name Radiotron. At that point in time, only RCA could legally sell radio tubes to the public. RCA would license its patents to AT&T and Westinghouse in 1920 and 1921. One of Westinghouse's first vacuum tubes was the 205D. DeForest had already made a deal with RCA to continue to make and sell his tubes within certain limits. RCA itself never manufactured a vacuum tube or a radio during the 1920s, since it was just a patent trust at the time. RCA was constantly chasing down radio bootleggers, men who would set up their own small tube factories and sell them illegally. Once caught, many of these bootleggers would just move and open up shops somewhere else. The battle was never-ending because the demand for radio tubes was so strong and profits were high. It was kind of like enforcing prohibition, and we all know how that turned out. Some of the more famous radio bootleggers were Otis Moorhead, Elmer T. Cunningham, and Elman B. Myers. If you'd like to find out more about them, my YouTube channel has documentaries on all of them for you to enjoy. Early in the 1920s, the UV-200 and the UV-201 tubes would dominate tube sales. Radios were run on batteries because so few people had electricity in their homes. The batteries were heavy and had to be recharged or replaced fairly frequently. This made owning a radio expensive for most families because the wages were so low back then. To reduce the operating cost of battery radios, RCA came out with a new line of battery radio tubes that drew only one quarter of an amp of power to run, instead of the one full amp needed by older tubes. Using these tubes would allow the batteries to last longer, reducing the number of times they needed to be recharged or replaced. These tubes would use the same code numbers with the letter A added to the end. The UV-201 tube would thus become the UV-201A. As the 1920s progressed, so did radio tubes. New and improved tubes would replace the WD-11, WD-12, and other earlier tubes that were less reliable because of the low manufacturing standards earlier on in the decade. Better filament material would be developed that allowed vacuum tubes to provide much stronger emissions, which made a huge difference in the performance of battery radios. Earlier radio tubes used tungsten filaments. Later tubes would use thoriated tungsten filaments. Filaments permeated with thoria, short for thorium oxide, a white powdered metal. The tubes required far less power and produced much higher emissions. The number and variations of vacuum tubes expanded during the 1920s. Electrically powered radios, which came out in 1927 and 1928, Require different tubes to run on from those used in battery-powered radios for most of the decade. Powered triodes for battery radios like the UV-202 and the UV-210 came out in the early to mid-20s. A power triode for electric radios, the UX-245, came out in 1929. One of the biggest developments in vacuum tube technology was the invention of the screen grid radio tube, more commonly known as the Tetrode. It was first created by Walter Herman Schottky in 1915, a solid-state physicist while working at Siemens. The early radios of the 1920s worked fairly well at lower and medium frequencies, but were very unstable at the higher frequencies that broadcast radio expanded to later in the decade. At higher frequencies, the triode's internal capacitance between the cathode and the plate would get worse. This would cause the tube to oscillate, producing unwanted frequencies. Schottky added a fourth element to the triode's plate, cathode, and grid. The fourth element was a control grid, or screen grid. The addition of the screen grid increased signal stability, while also increasing the tube's gain. Walter Schottky patented the screen grid tube in 1916. The screen grid tube would begin replacing the triode tubes in the mid to late 1920s in the United States with the arrival of electric radios. Another type of tube that debuted in the 20s was a photo tube. The photo tube was used in film editing to reproduce sound from motion picture films. Vacuum tubes came in many different shapes and sizes as you can see from these photos. Smaller tubes came in handy for smaller and portable radios. One tube, the WD-12, had a radio designed for it, the Crosley Pup. In the decades that followed the 1920s, many more uses were found for vacuum tubes, and the quality improved as their construction method changed from handmade to automated production. 
By the 1960s, the end of the vacuum tube brain was in sight, as smaller and more efficient transistors would begin to replace them in most electronic devices. Vacuum tubes have never gone away completely, as there are still many uses for them today. TWT tubes, or traveling wave tubes, are in use for amplifying high-powered microwave transmissions used in satellite communication. Television and radio stations use high-powered vacuum tubes in their broadcasting equipment. The Federal Aviation Administration still uses vacuum tubes in their radar systems, and PMT tubes, photomultiplier tubes, are used in many hospitals' PET scanners. In the music world, vacuum tubes are still used in amplifiers, as many of the world's top musical performers insist the vacuum tube amplifiers deliver a better and more accurate sound than solid-state amplifiers. Many of the tubes manufactured over 100 years ago are still in use today in antique radios. And just like those durable early vacuum tubes, the need for vacuum tubes endures. Well, that's it for this video. There'll be more to come as we continue to investigate the early history of the world's first true mass medium, radio. Thanks for watching.